Jasper McMahon lived near the elementary school he would be attending in the fall. The playground was practically in his backyard. He lived in a small blue house with white shutters and colorful garden beds. His mom had painted the beds an eclectic assortment of neons, and although none of the school children had ever stopped at Jasper's fence to look at the garden, any child would have easily known which house you meant if you mentioned the rainbow beds. Nearly every day after all the children had been picked up or bussed away and the playground was deserted, Jasper would climb the three-foot chain-link fence around his yard and hop over to the school grounds. He would usually have the playground to himself for an hour or so before tired parents having just gotten off work were dragged there by their ever-energetic toddlers. Some of the more outgoing toddlers would approach Jasper with wide eyes and ask if he wanted to play with them, but Jasper liked to play alone. As an only child, he had developed a strong inner dialogue, which, when combined with his budding imagination, could birth entire worlds on the playground. It could be a castle, or a treacherous mountain. It might be a shipwreck, or the home base for a league of superheroes. Jasper could make himself and the playground into whatever he wanted, and he was still young enough to be practically invisible to the parents of those bubbly toddlers. They paid him no mind as he ran about, climbing up slides, jumping off ladders, making rocket noises on the swings. They didn't look at him the way they looked at the big kids who came to the playground sometimes. Those kids didn't belong. They knew it, Jasper knew it, the toddler's parents knew it, but no one could do anything about it if they showed up. Those big kids usually climbed up to places Jasper's parents would have yelled at him for, after the big kids were done climbing around, they would sit in the playground's tallest tower, known to Jasper as the Lighthouse, and to talk loudly and use lots of bad words. Sometimes a toddler's parent would yell at the big kids and say things like, There are little kids around here, you shouldn't be talking like that. But the big kids would just laugh and curse even louder. Jasper's favorite days were the rainy ones, because no one else would come to the playground. Not even the big kids. On those days, the playground was a vessel battling a powerful gale, or maybe it was a fort under attack by enemies using the rain as cover. Jasper had seen this in a movie he watched with his dad that gave him nightmares for weeks. The only rule Jasper had to heed on the rainy days was that if he saw lightning, he had to go straight inside. His parents said the playground was made of metal, and because it was in the middle of the open field behind the school, it could attract lightning. You know that shock you get when you go down the slide and touch something afterwards? Jasper's dad had once asked him. Well, if you're on the playground when it gets struck by lightning, you'll get a shock about a thousand times stronger than that. This had made Jasper wince. He hated those stinging shocks from the slide. One stormy afternoon, Jasper had named the playground the Red Avenger and dubbed himself Captain Jasp, Pirate Lord. Whenever the wind howled through the playground's many pillars, Captain Jasp would howl back something like, Curse ye, ye poundin' storm! Or, You'll have to do better than that to sink my ship! Jasper would call to his imaginary first mate with orders to Hoist the mainsail! Or, Turn her starboard! Despite his best efforts, the Red Avenger still got caught in a whirlpool. It spun around and around. Rain began pelting Jasper's windbreaker and Captain Jasp stared into the abyss at the center of the swirling sea. "'You won't take me yet!' he asserted from atop the handrail of one of the playground's bridges. Of course, to Captain Jasp, this was the lookout at the top of the main mast. And just before Captain Jasp could announce his brilliant, life-saving plan, lightning flashed in the distance, just over the top of the school. Jasper hurried to climb down, desperate to get away from the playground, his disappointment in the sudden end to his game paled in comparison to his desire not to be shocked 1,000 times. His foot slipped on the wet handrail, and he went down. He barely caught himself from falling all the way to the soggy wood chips below with one leg and one hand. Lightning flashed again as the thunder from the first bolt vibrated the metal rail to which Jasper clung. The boy whimpered as he tried to pull himself up. He had his one leg hooked over the rail at the knee and five fingers wrapped around it, but his fingers were slipping. The distance between Jasper's head and the ground below was only three or four feet maximum. 
But as Jasper looked down, rain smattering his face now, the fall looked downright deadly. As the second round of thunder cracked, Jasper's little fingers finally slipped. The back of his head swung down and hit the bottom of the bridge before his bent knee gave out. He landed face down with a deep huff. Every molecule of air was forced from his lungs. He gasped desperately like a fish that had accidentally flopped ashore. He could taste the wet wood chips, even smell the saturated soil beneath them, but his lungs would not inflate. Little Jasper's vision began to change. The playground under the violent sky seemed to glow as if the entire structure were made of neon bulbs. The edges of his vision, in feathered contrast, were growing black and closing in. Am I dying? The boy wondered. He decided he must be. The storm had swallowed Captain Jasp. His vision was almost gone, and so was his hope. But just before the world went away, he heard someone calling his name far away. Jasper woke to the sound of his own mouth sucking down air like a vacuum cleaner. He actually felt his body rise as his lungs finally inflated. His vision returned starry and warbled, but evened out with his breathing. His nose stung, and when he crawled to his knees, rainwater dripped out of his nostrils. Where his face had lain, a muddy puddle had started to form. Jasper. There was the voice again, the one which had called his name as he blacked out. Thunder burst overhead. Jasper was sure his mom would be looking for him to come home, but this voice didn't belong to her. It didn't belong to anyone he knew. I'm over here, Jasper. The voice echoed strangely, as though far away. Although it wasn't shouting, in order to be heard above the wind, the voice must have been coming from somewhere near him. Jasper did a quick scan of the playground, but no one else was there. Under here. This time, Jasper caught the voice's direction, at least. It was coming from under the largest platform of the playground. He was glad to scurry underneath to get out of the rain. Where are you? I don't see you, Jasper said. Over here, the voice replied. It had a sharp ring to it, like someone speaking into an aluminum can. Finally, Jasper understood. He knew what made a voice sound like that. He looked to his left and saw one end of the playground's talk tube hanging down like a wilted tulip. From his position, he could see the other end of the tube next to the spiral slide, but there wasn't anyone there. Still, he crawled to the showerhead-shaped speaker and whispered into it. Hello? You found me, the voice congratulated. How come I can't see you? Jasper asked. Cryptically, the voice asked in return, Do you pray, Jasper? Sometimes. Who do you pray to? Jasper wrinkled his nose. As far as he knew, there was only one person anyone prayed to. He answered, I pray to God. Seeming to have anticipated this answer, the voice asked, Can you see God? No, Jasper replied with a wondrous upturn. So you already talked to someone you can't see. Why not talk to me? Jasper answered this with a question only time can ever truly answer. Are you my friend? The voice replied, Yes, if you'll be mine. But I have to go home, said Jasper, because of the lightning. The lightning is gone, friend. It passed us by. We can play now. Jasper looked over his shoulder, through the fence, at his little blue house with its white shutters and colorful garden beds. He figured his mom would have come out to yell at him by now if she was concerned or wanted him home. It hadn't felt like much time had passed since he fell, but the sky above did seem calmer than before. Um, sure, I'll play. What kinds of games can you play? He asked the voice in the talk tube. He expected the answer to be something like 20 questions or I spy, anything that could be played through speech rather than action. But the voice answered, Let's play tag. Incredulously, Jasper said, Okay. And the voice present, breathy, and free of the metallic echo from behind him said, You're it. The drowning sound of wind stopped short, the chilling breeze ceased, and darkness instantly covered Jasper's world. 
But this was a darkness he could control. Thin slits of piercing white light told him so. He could open his eyes, but he dared not. Suddenly, one of them glowed brighter than the other. He could see nothing but a vivid orange curtain. I have an ocular response, an unfamiliar woman's voice said. A familiar gasp followed, and that was followed by a dull clattering sound. Oh, please stay back, Mrs. McMahon, another unfamiliar voice said. Jasper knew who Mrs. McMahon was, though. That was what other grown-ups called his mom. Mom? he asked, still unwilling to open his eyes. Oh, stay down, honey. Let the nurse take a look at you. We need to make sure nothing's broken, said his mother's voice. Jasper wondered, broken? What would be broken? And what happened to the playground and the... the... whoever was talking through the talk tube? Shouldn't need to worry about broken bones, the first woman said, more comfortingly than she had talked about the ocular response. The doctor will order an x-ray to be sure, but I don't see any indication that he broke anything. Speaking of the doctor, I'll go get her, said the second stranger. It was a really nasty fall, I just want to be sure, Jasper's mom said. A fall? When I fell off the playground? Jasper wondered. Admittedly, everything that had happened since was growing harder to remember. The details were fading, much like a dream from the night before, one which seems unforgettably vivid, one you're convinced is real but recedes to the dampest cellar of your mind before breakfast. Mom, what happened to me? Jasper asked. He still had his eyes closed. I remember there was lightning and I fell off the bridge and when I got up, honey, you didn't get up. I was so scared when I saw you fall and then when you weren't moving, But how did I get here? he asked. The slivers of light started to feel more friendly to him. Gingerly, he allowed his eyelids to part, slightly, enough to see through his interweaved eyelashes. The room was very bright. Everything was colored either white or light gray. Even the nurse wore a brilliantly white uniform, and her hair dyed to almost match. She wasn't old, though. Her face was the only thing that provided enough contrast in his limited vision for him to make out. It was younger and more friendly than he had expected. Her voice, which had sounded like the rich, mature voice of an older woman with a thousand stories, had misled him. The woman looked cool and confident. But Jasper, without even noticing, detected a youthful sense of fun in her too. There was something in both of them which made him feel bonded to her like a little brother. I hear you were playing over at Foreman Elementary, the nurse said. I used to go to school there. That playground was brand new when I started first grade. I was so sad when they tore down the old one, but that new one is pretty cool, isn't it? Jasper nodded. He didn't know about the old playground, but he did think the new one was pretty cool. Ugh, I wish they would just maintain those old playgrounds instead of ripping them down, Jasper's mom injected. The old wooden ones they had when I was a kid were so much fun. They always looked like castles. Our imaginations would just run wild. The nurse did not give Raquel, Jasper's mom, the agreeable nod or smile she had expected. The nurse's jaw remained set, and she busied herself with wrapping a blood pressure cuff around Jasper's arm. Well, this one needed to come down, unfortunately. I thought it was awesome, but over the summer... She looked up at Jasper to see if he already knew what she was talking about. When it was clear he had no idea, she vaguely stated, There was an accident. That rickety old thing couldn't be fixed up, and even if it could, I think everybody would have wanted it replaced anyway. Raquel wanted badly to ask more about this accident, but understood the nurse didn't feel it was appropriate to discuss in front of her innocent young son. It must have been bad. Jasper recognized his mom's body language, leaning forward as if by getting closer to the nurse she could absorb the information. He was glad she didn't ask, because he didn't want to know what kind of accident could make a playground get torn down. What if it happened again because of him and his fall? That had been an accident, too. The doctor came in to put in an order for an x-ray, though, like the nurse, she doubted it would reveal any broken bones. She told Jasper he was lucky. He had a minor concussion and would need to be monitored for a while before he could go home, but he would be all right in the long run. After the doctor left, Raquel said, I'm so sorry, but do you mind if I run to the restroom? The nurse smiled knowingly and replied, He'll be just fine here. Raquel thanked her and slipped out of the small examination room. 
It felt quieter without her there. Jasper felt afraid to speak for some reason. Lucky for him, the nurse spoke first. Sometimes concussions can make our brains act a little differently than usual. Jasper looked up, but did not reply. She continued, Loud sounds might be painful and bright lights. Things might seem a little foggy, maybe like you're in a dream. And your memory might be a little scrambled until you're better. She was saying all of this while looking at the computer monitor, but when she finished, she looked over her shoulder to gauge his reaction. Jasper nodded politely, and she turned back to the computer. When you woke up, you told your mom you thought you had gotten up after you fell. Remember anything else? Jasper didn't reply, so she looked over her shoulder again. The expression that met her was one of deep suspicion. She smiled. You're not crazy, Jasper. When I was a little girl in first grade, I used to hear a voice at the playground. It would talk to me through one of those speaker things. You know, the ones that go underground? The talk tube, Jasper specified. Yes, I don't think I ever knew what those things were called. You just taught me something, said the nurse. But Jasper, that voice, it belongs to the child who had the accident that made them tear down the old playground. You have to be careful when you talk to him. He can be tricky. Jasper's jaw dropped. He asked, How did you know? Just had a feeling you might not be telling your mama everything. I know I didn't ever tell mine. Is it... A ghost? Jasper asked. The nurse laughed. No, not quite. Sort of, I guess. It's hard to explain. I had a few friends who heard him and talked to him. We think he lived in our imaginations, but not like the normal stuff we made up on our own. We think he figured out how to get in there by himself. How? asked Jasper. I don't know. One day we all just started hearing him. Not all at once, but slowly one at a time. So, I imagined him, and he's real? Jasper asked. You're starting to get it, she chuckled. She stood up from the stool and stepped over to the bed. She felt his forehead with a hand that felt cool and comforting. Now, Jasper, I don't want to scare you, but I need to tell you something important about that voice. Can you pay close attention for me? Jasper nodded, wincing as his sensitive brain knocked against his skull. When you imagine him, you make him real. When he creeps into your mind, you have to ignore him. The more attention you give him, the more real he becomes. And soon, you won't have any control over him. Jasper asked, Then what happens? It depends. Depends on how you treat him. He wants your attention, and when he becomes real, he can get really jealous. He won't want you playing with other kids or doing anything he doesn't want to do. It happened to a friend of mine. She talked with him at recess every day until she said she could actually see him. The rest of us couldn't, even when she told us where he was standing. Pretty soon, she had to stop playing games with us because he said she couldn't anymore. He didn't want to lose her attention and fade away again. Mom says if someone is being mean to me, I should tell her. If the kid in the talk tube gets mean, I can... Jasper? The nurse interrupted sweetly. I'm afraid most grown-ups will think the kid is just make-believe. They won't understand how serious this is. You have to control him on your own, okay? Just don't give him too much attention. It'll be all right, I promise. He started leaving me alone by the second grade. I just ignored him until he went away. The door opened and Raquel re-entered the room. The nurse smiled at her and said, Perfect. X-ray is ready for him. Let's head on down the hall. Wait, what's your name? Jasper asked. The nurse gave him one last warm smile and said, You can call me Nurse Bree. The rest of the day was a blur of nurses and doctors explaining complicated things to Raquel and dumbing them down for Jasper. The pain in his head didn't go away until everyone finally stopped talking to him and looking at him and touching him. The first doctor who looked at him came back and gave he and his mom the okay to go. Outside, it had gotten dark, and not from storms this time. Night had fallen gently while they were inside the fluorescent hospital. The contrast jarred Jasper at first, but he quickly found the navy overtones of the night world far more comfortable for his eyes. No longer were they screaming at the front part of his brain. He fell asleep on the car ride home and stayed asleep while his mother carried him inside and laid him on his own bed. She flicked on his nightlight and closed the door. 
she forgot to close the curtains like she usually did. And outside, the wet playground glistened under the moonlight. The following morning, Jasper slept in so late he missed his dad leaving for work. He had wanted to go play after breakfast, but Raquel made him stay inside. She said she didn't trust that his head was healed all the way and didn't want him making it worse by slipping again. She kept him in all day. The most disappointing part was when he begged and finally convinced his mom to let him watch a movie, but then found the screen hurt his head when he looked at it for too long. See, you're not better yet, Raquel had said. Jasper filled the time with Legos and his Hot Wheel racetrack instead. Once he felt tired, he took an abnormally long nap that bled into the night. Jasper woke at a normal time the next day. His dad gave him an enormous hug, saying, Feels like I haven't seen you in forever, kid. You've done nothing but sleep whenever I'm home. Sorry, Daddy. No, no, I'm glad you've gotten some rest. How's your head doing? Jasper said, It feels really good. I think I'm ready to go outside again. Right, Mom? Raquel shared a look with her husband that didn't bode well for Jasper. Please, I promise I'll be careful. How about this? No climbing, no swinging, and no jumping. You can use the stairs and go down the slides. You can pretend the playground is a fort and all that, but don't do anything that could lead to you falling again, okay? We just need to make sure your head... I know, I know. Thank you, Mommy. Jasper was practically out the door before his heels were all the way in his shoes. It was a beautiful day, the polar opposite of the last time he had been at the playground. No lightning would try to force him home today. He decided he was a knight, nobly defending the castle from invaders with his trusty bow and arrow. This, he reasoned, was something he could do without any risk to his sensitive brain. There's one over there, he shouted to a pretend brother in arms. Then, you got him. And from below, an echoey, ringing voice said, There's another one over there, Sir Jasper. Jasper dropped his imaginary bow to his side. His other arm, which had been reaching into his invisible quiver for another arrow, fell too. He looked down through the slits of the guardrail at the end of the talk tube, that hollow shower head, and pretended not to hear. The nurse had said if he imagined the other kid, he would make him real. So he would just not imagine him. Come on, Sir Jasper. He's getting too close, the voice rang. Jasper was confused as to why he could still hear it. Nurse Bree said I shouldn't talk to you, Jasper said. What? I can't hear you, the voice taunted. Louder, Jasper repeated. Nurse Bree said, Come down here, Jasper. I can't understand what you're saying. Jasper's shoulders sagged as he descended the steps one at a time not leaping down them like he usually did in case his mom was watching him through the window. He ducked under the playground and crossed over to the talk tube. I'm here, he said. There you are. I was having trouble hearing you so far away. Nurse Bree said I shouldn't talk to you, Jasper said a third time. Bree? Oh, I remember her, the voice said. She was so boring. She never wanted to play anything fun like pirates or knights. She wasn't anything like you, Jasper. Really? She seemed nice to me, Jasper replied. Oh, sure. She's nice, but she's no fun. She said you're not really real. The voice laughed. The hollow snickering echoed eerily in the tube and made Jasper shrink back a little. What do you think, Jasper? Don't I seem real to you? I mean, you're here talking to me, aren't you? Like you talk to God. Do you think God is pretend? No, I guess not. But you can't even hear him. No. So don't you think I'm real? But Nurse Bree said, Jasper, Jasper, Jasper. Do you want to see just how real I can be? Jasper swallowed. He looked around, hoping someone a parent with a toddler in tow, or even the big kids, would show up. He didn't want to be alone anymore. Well, do you? The voice asked. Not really, Jasper replied. I think I'm scared of you. Well, then you better not imagine me standing on the bridge, the voice said. At this suggestion, 
Jasper turned toward the bridge he had fallen off of two days before. Of course, by concentrating on not imagining a boy on the bridge, Jasper's mind conjured the image as if it had to construct the scene before it could block it out. In doing so, he inadvertently made the boy appear. The boy was about Jasper's size, but seemed older somehow. He wore dirty clothes caked with mud. He looked like he had splashed face first in a muddy puddle, just like Jasper had before. His face looked friendly at first. His eyes gleamed and he smiled down at Jasper. But the longer Jasper looked into his eyes, the more odious the boy's expression seemed. His eyes glistened with malice. His toothy smile appeared hungry for blood. And speaking of blood, it was pouring down from his left ear, covering his neck and soaking his collar. But he did not seem bothered by this injury. Jasper fell back on his hands and Crab walked over the wood chips to get away from the now visible boy he had accidentally imagined into existence. Go away, he commanded. The boy cocked his head as if confused. Then an enlightened look came over him. I'm sorry, is this frightening you? The boy reached up to the pulpy mess of his ear and pinched something there. His head jerked as he yanked at whatever it was. It came out with a wet squelch. Blood shot out of his ear in rhythmic, pulsating streams. Between two fingers, he held a long piece of splintered wood, dripping with blood and something squishy and gray. Is that better? The boy asked. Jasper ran home as fast as his short legs could carry him. Once inside, he bolted the lock and waited for his heart to settle. His mom called out from somewhere in the house, and he answered that it was just him. He used those words specifically, it's just me, because he wanted more than anything to believe them. It was a few days before he could return to the playground, and even then he had to wait until he saw a family out there through his window. For the rest of the summer, Jasper only played on the playground when other people were there too. Their voices, their very real, unimaginary voices, kept any others at bay. That fall, it was time for Jasper to start kindergarten. About a week in, during recess, he noticed a girl about his age speaking into the talk tube. He crouched to look under the playground at the other end of the tube and was unsurprised to see no one there. Jasper himself went to that end of the tube and said, Hi, I'm Jasper. Jasper, why do you sound different now? said the girl. I'm not the other kid. I'm real. Jasper said. He sounded real to me, said the girl. He wanted to be my friend. Jasper made eye contact with her through the pillars under the playground and smiled. He said, If you need somebody, I'll be your friend. And she smiled back. The two of them played together at recess for the rest of the year. They played all sorts of games together, full of imagination and pretend. But now, having each other for friends... Neither of them needed to conjure an imaginary one. They occasionally heard a voice in the talk tube hissing threats, but encouraged each other just to ignore it, until one day, it stopped. The children didn't even notice. Jasper didn't think about the imaginary boy again until he was all grown up. His parents had gone on a trip together and asked him to watch their house, tend to the colorful garden beds and such. He was out in the yard, bending over one of the faded beds, when he happened to look up and see a lonely-looking child listening at the rusted end of the talk tube. Hello, he called over the fence. Looking for a friend? 